Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Brankley and welcome to the final installment of my series on the common risk language. How do you fit a tool to the standardized risk levels? This video has been rated intermediate. Discussion will include a focus on logistic regression, which may be unfamiliar to some. I will endeavor to make it accessible to as many as possible, but a familiarity with statistics would be a benefit. If you have any questions or comments about the content or use of this video, please comment below or email me directly. In part one, we discussed how risk was not categorical in nature. Risk is a dimension and risk assessment is evaluating where someone's risk falls on that dimension and then find a way to communicate that with others for decision making. The problem is dimensions don't lend themselves well to categories or decision making, especially as policy and practice can vary by location. If we compare commonly used risk assessment tools, we see gross discrepancies in how the risk levels are distributed and that there is very little agreement across tools. In part two, we learned that different things can contribute to risk and that we need to separate risk for sexual offending from risk for general offending. I discussed the specifics of both general and sexual risk using the standardized risk levels and highlighted the differences of describing higher levels of risk for general offending from sexual offending. Today, I will be focusing on general offending but the methods I will describe can equally apply to sexual offending. I will point out a few of the small differences. However, a detailed description can be found in Hansen and colleagues 2017 paper published in Psychological Assessment. So now you understand the standardized risk levels, but how do you fit them to a tool? Well, let's imagine you, you work for the Rebel Alliance in Star Wars and they take a break from rebelling against the evil empire to deal with a problem. They are finding that some of the rebels are defecting to the empire. Good. <laughs> Your hate has made you powerful. Not to be undone, the rebel leaders band together and create a tool that will measure risk for defecting to the empire, and they want to use the common risk language to describe it. Their tool is called the RAR, the Rebel Alliance Assessment of Risk. There are 12 items, each scored 0 to 2, with a total score ranging from 0 to 24. Examples of items are, number 3 is thinks Darth Vader has made some good points. Item 12 is, you know, has been seen trying on stormtrooper armor. The question is, what scores are associated with which standardized risk levels? To figure that out, we need three pieces of information. Percentile ranks, relative risk, and absolute risk. Percentiles are important because they define the middle of level 3. The 50th percentile on the RAR is a score of 13. This may be higher than other risk tools due to the fact that it is not uncommon for a rebel to have doubts about the rebellion, thinking it may be easier if they worked with the Empire. We can find our absolute and relative risk information from logistic regression. Specifically, logistic regression with a fixed two-year follow-up for general recidivism, or for sexual recidivism, you would use a fixed five-year follow-up. This information should come from either a large normative sample or, for best results, a meta-analysis of fixed two-year follow-up data. So let me explain what a two-year fixed follow-up means and why it is important. Imagine you have a large sample with recidivism data. Each person should have two sets of time variables for the recidivism analyses. The length of time from their date at risk to the date you stop collecting data, that is called their follow-up time. 
then you will have the time from date at risk to the date they committed a new crime. If they have not committed a new crime, this time will be equal to their follow-up time. So some people will have at least two years of follow-up time, but have defected or reoffended prior to the end of two years. They would be included in our analyses. Some other individuals will not defect or reoffend within those two years. It doesn't matter if they defected later, they will be treated as a non-defector or non-recidivist for these analyses. If someone defected in less than 24 months, but we had only been following him for 20, we should not include him. He didn't have enough follow-up time. Not good enough. Not good enough! Not including these individuals may become more intuitive if you consider how it would bias the sample. Think of it. We would not include non-defectors with less than 24 months, Maybe a two by two table will help. The rows are on the top, greater than or equal to two years of follow-up time. On the bottom row, you have less than two years of follow-up time. The left column is whether they defected or not within those two years. And on the right column, for individuals who did not defect during those two years. If you have more than two years, we will include you in the fixed two-year follow-up analyses. But if we included the defectors with less than two years, we would oversample defectors and make the absolute recidivism rate look higher than it is. So we only include individuals with at least two years of follow-up time. So here's the equation for a logistic regression. We need two pieces of information from it. We need the B0, which tells us the base rate of defecting or reoffending. We also need the B1, which is the risk ratio for the RAR. Understanding this relationship may be easier if you think of reoffending or defecting like a speedometer. The base rate is like your average speed. The risk ratio is about how responsive your car is to changes in acceleration or deceleration. A smaller risk ratio is like having a car that is less sensitive to changes in pressure on the accelerator. It takes a greater change in pressure to speed up or slow down the car. The bigger the risk ratio, the less pressure is needed to change speeds or measure differences in likelihood of reoffending. For the RAR, the B0 is negative 0.4. This may not seem very useful as it is in a logistic metric, but once you transform it out of the log metric, it is equal to a base rate of 40.1% recidivism within a two year period. For the purpose of this demonstration, I took the rate of new criminal offenses observed in a large sample of individuals from the US. This is the same report cited in the white paper on the standardized risk levels, and it is available to you below in the description of this video. Now, 40.1% is almost half of the sample. And if your imaginations are struggling to imagine 40.1% as the base rate of defecting in my Star Wars example, remember, you rebel scum. The rebels did not have it easy. The B1 is equal to 0 0.2965, which is a logged odds ratio. Again, this may not seem very useful in its log metric, but once you transform it out of the log metric, this is equal to an odds ratio of 1.34. This means that for every one point of change in the scale, there's a 34% change in risk for defecting. That is all the information we need, so let's put this all together. We know that a score of 13 is the 50th percentile. 
I used an Excel spreadsheet and that equation to calculate the risk ratio associated with each score on the RAR, assuming that the average risk, a risk ratio of one, is equal to a score of 13. Using the same Excel spreadsheet, I also calculated the absolute risk, assuming the above relative risk and the base rate of defecting as 40.1%. So let's finish off the boundaries of level three. We consider width of level three to be equal to plus or minus one treatment effect. That can be described as either a difference of 10% in absolute risk or relative risk of 1.4. This would include scores 12 and 14, but we couldn't quite go out to 11 or 15 because they are slightly outside of the defined area. Level one is defined by the desistance threshold, which for us is anything less than 5% after two years. This includes scores zero to four. Level two is equal to all scores associated with a higher risk than level one, but a slower risk than level three. In this case, it scores five through 11. As level four is defined in a similar manner to level two, we need to define level five first. Scores of 21 plus have rates of defecting higher than 85%, and constitute our threshold for almost certain to defect or reoffend. This means that scores between 15 and 20 are equal to a level four. And that's it. That's how you define the standardized risk levels. One of the amazing things about using this system is that the distribution of the scores is normal with most people scoring in level three. Then the next most likely score is to be levels two or four, with very few people scoring in the extremes of level one or five. I know I have made it look easy, so I must warn you that not all risk tools can measure every standardized risk level. Two problems in particular can make it difficult for tools to measure all standardized risk levels. First, if you have a smaller risk ratio, it can be difficult to detect changes in risk, especially at the extremes. Here is the information from the RAR as previously described. Below it, I'm going to place the same outline of information but I'm going to change the risk ratio from 1.34, as it is right now, to 1.2. And let's see what happens. Let's have a look at the differences. First, you can see that a score of 13 on both risk tools has the same relative risk and absolute risk. That shouldn't be surprising because it is determined without considering the relative risk parameter but you can see the distribution of risk has flattened. Levels two, three, and four are bigger in the lower table than they are in the top table. Also, the tool on the bottom can no longer detect levels one and five. Imagine it like having less acute vision and not being able to visually tell the differences between an orange and a grapefruit. It's not that the grapefruit isn't there, it's just that when you see it, you'll categorize it as an orange. Another problem can come up with changes in the base rate of the outcome. This is not a problem with the tool per se, but can create problems for measuring the full range of risk. The problem is particularly noticeable when the base rate is much lower as is the case with sexual offending. In this case, you would need a large risk ratio to accomplish the Herculean task of moving that needle from the 5.6% base rate into the 85% zone needed to measure the lower threshold for level five. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please feel free to share it for training or teaching purposes, or to convince others of a way to address problems in risk communication. I am happy for you to use the video or slides in your presentations. I just ask that you reference it accordingly. Also, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions.